Then we'll start with Alto. Um, so you, you, let's just start with vacancies, because they're really important. Um, the, um, uh, you, you, I'm, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, but you, you know that uh, they're very important, uh, for instance, for um, diffusion. Right? Bec um, and they're also the predominant point defects in thermal equilibrium in, um, in any crystalline material, hmm? certainly in steel. And, uh, and you can basically compute, if you know the, uh, the formation uh, enthalpy or of a, uh, a vacancy, you, you can compute the concentration of vacancies, that's the ratio of uh, vacant lattice places to uh, total lattice uh, positions, yes? And it's basically this exponential function. Hmm? So, uh, and you can plug in uh, values mm, the, for the vacancy uh, formation enthalpy and for the Boltzmann constant and for the temperature. Say, for instance, we choose uh, the reheating temperature of, uh, of steel in many industrial processes around 1250. You mm, get uh, 1523K. You obtain 10 to the minus 7. Mm, right. So, that's all very well. So there are, are predominant point defects, but in our case, we're interested in, in vacancies, not at equilibrium, uh, but in non-equilibrium state situations. So it, when you process steels, we very often do uh, things like quenching mm, and or plastic deformation, yes? And when you do this, you always generate, or you end, well, end up with a, uh, m many more vacancies than at, at room temperature, for instance, than uh, you anticipate. So you have an excess density of vacancies. You, and I also said that, for instance, when you, when you have these, uh, these loops, excuse me, these dipoles, you can have interstitial dipoles, and that's a way of creating interstitials in uh, your material. But uh, the the amount of vacancies you make by plastic different oh, is very much larger than interstitials. Hmm? Right. Um, of course, uh, diffusion, self-diffusion in substitutional diffusion in steels is related to uh, concentration and mobility of these vacancies. Hmm? And so uh, if you have an excess uh, vacancies, it will impact, uh, for instance, diffusion, but also the mechanical properties. Hmm? Okay, you, so another thing that's important is looking at the ratio of um, uh, migration to formation enthalpy of a point defect to have an idea of its mobility. Hmm? So the enthalpy uh, of vacancy formation in BCC metals is about uh, the melting temperature divided by thousands, yeah, this is the order of 1.8 EV. The migration enthalpy is related to elastic properties, and, and so there are formulas for that uh, shown here. And that gives you about 0.57 EV. So if you make the ratio of uh, 0.57 and 1.8, you get a value that's 0.3. Okay? Uh, well, it turns out that that's a, that's a really low value, yes, and uh, is a good indication to tell you that vacancies are very mobile in alpha iron. Hmm? And that means that, for instance, when you, uh, you uh, reheat, you, you, you do a recrystallization annealing of steel, and you, you need to quench the material, you quench the material, yes, you will have a large amount of excess vacancy at room temperatures. Mo we call them mono-vacancies, isolated vacancies. Hmm? Um, but that doesn't uh, stay very long like that. Uh, they will quickly form complexes. Hmm? They will attach themselves to substitutional atoms, yes? Uh, or interstitial atoms, yes? Or they will attach uh, uh, to each other. They will form uh, vacancy clusters. Yeah? Uh, basically, little 
empty spaces in your crystal uh, by clustering with about typically 100 vacancies. Yeah? Uh, and you can observe these things. Yeah? For instance, if you take a, uh, uh, a steel yeah? and you, uh, you heat it up, mm? uh, and then you, you quench it really rapidly, mm? uh, you can observe that um, your structure is full of these uh, blobs, let's say. Yeah? Um, and if you, you orient them, if, if you, you manage to orient your crystal correctly, uh, if you, you will, in certain directions, they, these blobs will, will actually look like very crystallographic uh, have very crystallographic directions. They, they will actually be on, lying on uh, one or, or planes. Hmm? What, what are these? It's basically clusters of vacancies. Hmm? So if what, what you're actually seeing here is the vacancy, so this is a lattice, the pure lattice, yeah? and you've, all, you've got all these vacancies in the lattice, that uh, come together, yeah, and uh, they coagulate, right? So when, when a vacancy comes here, that means that an, an iron atom has replaced it, right? So, and uh, so when all these vacancies come together on a plane, yes, they form a little platelet of vacancies, yeah? And so if I redraw this, but now using a dislocation picture, yes, this is what it looks like. It's as if I have an extra half plane coming this way, an extra half plane coming that way, and in between nothing, right? So it's as if I had take, uh, some, you know, put in vacancies. Right? Uh, and, and so you form a little circular loop Yes, and, and this, these are these circular loops. These are these circles that you see everywhere you know, here in this uh, structure. Hmm? So they, they, you know, they, they're there, they're real, and if you have uh, excess vacancies, uh, they, will, they will tend to, uh, certainly if the concentration is high, to form dislocation loops. Hmm? In addition, yeah, uh, there's some interesting effects is that this is a rather high energy situation, yes? And what you, what you often see is that these vacancy loops will um, uh, form hmm, on screw dislocations. And there will be uh, a number of um, uh, process steps. I will, uh, will not talk about these processes. But that will end up giving you a screw dislocation that goes like this that form a helical dislocation. And you can see them. Um, for instance, here is a very nice one. Look, there are a couple over there, yes. So you, you form helical dislocation uh, structures as a consequence of, this, of the uh, absorption of many uh, 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 vacancies on a, a screw dislocation. It's almost weekend, Elisa. <laughs> She's like, oh. Right, okay. So that's for um, the, the vacancies, uh, one type of uh, point defects. Other types of point defects uh, are interstitials, yes, obviously. Um, the interstitials we care about are hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and, and boron. Boron is... Uh, a little bit uh, ambiguous as a point defect, but let's just uh, say a few things about uh, hydrogen. So hydrogen is a very small atom. It's very um, insoluble in alpha iron, yes? Um, and, uh, but it's uh, very mobile in alpha iron. Actually creates a lot of problems, and we'll talk hopefully about this when we talk about um, hydrogen 
uh, cracking in ferritic steels. Yeah? In, uh, in gamma iron, it's very uh, different. We have a very high solubility for hydrogen and a very low mobility. Mm? So dislocation, uh, excuse me, the, um, you can dissolve much more hydrogen in, in gamma iron, but it doesn't diffuse very quickly. Mm? And it's quite surprising because um, you know, hydrogen being such a small atom. Uh, the, uh, in contrast to carbon and uh, nitrogen, which uh, uh, are in the tetragonal uh, lattice um, interstices, mm? the hydrogen is in so-called T sites or tetragonal sites. Mm? This is a hydrogen lying in tetragonal site. Mm? And it has a very low activation energy for diffusion. is so 0.047. So that's, that's um, the activation energy for carbon is 0.8. So it's like 20 times less, right? So it's, it's, it's extremely rapid uh, diffusing um, uh, element in, in uh, alpha iron. Hmm? Uh, right, so hydrogen is, can be trapped at uh, dislocations, in particular screw dislocation. Yeah? Uh, and uh, it, once it's trapped in the dislocations, one of the things we know is that it's, it's really trapped at dislocations. So it doesn't really diffuse rapidly along the core of the dislocation to give you something that's called pipe diffusion. It doesn't happen with hydrogen. <coughs> Okay, so that's just some information about uh, important uh, interstitial. Another important interstitial, we'll come back to uh, carbon, uh, is um, in, uh, many times in, in course. Uh, but so uh, gen some general things, the carbon is located in tetragonal interstices in, uh, in both alpha iron and gamma iron. Hmm? The solubility of uh, carbon in alpha iron is extremely low yeah? uh, and the reason is that uh, even in the tetragonal excuse me, oct uh, octahedral sites um, uh, where you find the carbon where the carbon is located it, you will have considerable lattice distortion yes? and so when, when we put in a carbon atom in an uh, octahedral site it pushes, it distorts the octahedron. It expands the octahedron in the z direction and it contracts it in, uh, the, uh, in the plane of the uh, octahedron. Hmm? Right, so although we, and nitrogen does uh, the same, the, although we uh, and certainly in introductory classes on, um, on, on steels, um, people have the tendency to say, well, carbon and nitrogen, they behave the same way. That's not uh, strictly true uh, in terms of lattice distortions, in terms of diffusivity, yes, but um, uh, nitrogen in contrast to uh, uh, carbon, will stay in solution much more easily than, than carbon. Uh, carbon has a very high tendency to, to form carbides, things like cementite. Nitrogen's much more difficult to uh, get it out of solution. Yes, um, and that's, that's important because uh, you probably know from undergraduate uh, lectures that um, uh, aging is a you know, traditional problem in, for steels, but it's not carbon aging. That's, that's the big problem. It's nitrogen aging. Okay. So you, you really need to stabilize the nitrogen. It's dif more difficult than uh, carbon. The other thing is uh, carbon has a really nice uh, property is that it, because it's not very soluble in the lattice, it will go to grain boundaries. Yes? And when it's in the grain boundaries as a solute, yes, it strengthens the grain boundary cohesion. So that's, that's good. Yeah? So we, we don't mind a little bit of solute carbon in the lattice. Nitrogen doesn't do this. Nitrogen stays pretty much um, 
homogeneously distributed in the, uh, in the lattice. Hmm? Okay. Oh, sorry. So the, the, when carbon atom goes from, uh, from one octahedral position to the next octahedral position, the one that's closest by is this one here between these two atoms here, it has to go through a tetrahedral uh, position. Hmm? And, uh, and that's a very high energy position, and, and that's what explains um, uh, yeah, the, the activation energy of 0.8 electron volts, about 0.8 electron volts. Uh, boron is um, some special properties. It's low temperatures. It's um, substitutional, but it diffuses interstitially. It's kind of interesting, yeah? And uh, at higher temperature, it becomes an interstitial solute, yeah? with a very fast interstitial diffusion. Hmm? So um, if you do thermal treatments, yeah, high temperature, you, you, you take your, your steel to high temperature, the boron goes interstitially, and then when you quench it, you get lots of interstitial boron rather than substitutional boron, which, which is the normal position of boron uh, at low temperatures. Hmm? Okay, so that's kind of interesting uh, to know. Uh, okay, so, so we have point defects. Yeah? Uh, point defects interact with each other, and point defects also interact with dislocations. Hmm? So let's uh, say a few things of, of uh, this. Hmm? So a steel, hmm, the atoms are not really distributed homogeneously. There is a lot of point defect um, associations going on. Hmm? Uh, so the solution is very often not perfectly random hmm? because vacancies, interstitials, and substitutional atoms will, will form complex, hmm? will form pairs or uh, point defect complexes. Yes. And so this type of interaction will have an impact because it will, for instance, have an impact on solubility or precipitation kinetics. For instance, I'll give you an example. If you have pure iron carbon alloys, the carbon that's in supersaturation will precipitate more rapidly than in the case of an iron manganese carbon alloy. Because in the manganese, because the manganese when it's present will form dipoles, so uh, it will combine, it, will have a very, it has a very strong attractive interaction with carbon, yes? And that keeps, it in, that keeps the carbon in solution, yes? It prevents the precipitation formation of carbides. Hmm? Hmm? So for instance, a strong uh, in, uh, attractive interaction with nitrogen and manganese, nitrogen and chrome, hmm? but uh, the it, there can be attraction, but there can also be repulsion. A, a, a weak repulsion between ca carbon and chrome, and a very strong repulsive interaction between carbon and, and, and silicon. Hmm? One of the uh, stable complexes in alpha iron yeah, is our carbon vacancy complexes. Yeah? They have a high bin binding energy, hmm? and so several carbon atoms can uh, be associated with a single vacancy. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's the, the, the existence of these, uh, and, and they are very highly mobile. They can move very quickly to the lattice. And, and this is this association of uh, carbon vacancy complexes has been used to explain enhancement of carbon diffusivity at higher temperatures. Mm -hmm. Things can be can change dramatically when you go from ferritic to austenitic situation. So whereas carbon vacancies, carbon and vacancies form complexes in alpha iron, they don't in gamma iron. Hmm? The interaction energy is negative, yeah? and so it's slightly repulsive. Hmm? So very complex uh, things happen with uh, point defects in, uh, in, in steel, and it's a uh, it's not very much studied, except for people who worry about these things. 
um, if you're in the nuclear industry, yes, uh, you generate a lot of point defects in your material, yes, and you're worried about uh, what these excess uh, point defects do to your material. So this brings me to uh, interstitials and uh, self-interstitials in alpha iron. Yeah? Uh, when you irradiate metals, you irradiate iron or iron alloys, uh, ferritic alloys, uh, martensitic alloys that are used in nuclear applications, um, you, uh, you form vacancies and you form uh, interstitial uh, self-interstitial atoms, uh, S SIAs. Uh, so the thing is, you have to imagine that these nuclear reactors, they operate for, you know, not for a few minutes, they operate for years and years, right? So the, there is this very slow but steady production of point defects, and eventually, uh, you know, it, you get observable uh, damage to the, the structure of your, of your uh, material. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, everybody's very concerned about this. Uh, and, uh, and there's lots of work by the um, uh, steel research community in the nuclear industry on point defects. Yeah, yeah so, so these um, the neutrons, they, 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 when they interact with the solid, they, they give cascades of, uh, create cascades of vacancies and interstitials, yes? And uh, that is an unstable situation. You form clusters of interstitials. And these clusters, uh, surprisingly enough, are extremely mobile. Yeah? They're like plate-like clusters that can move very quickly through the lattice. Yeah? And uh, these clusters will interact with dislocations with grain boundaries. And, and, and that can have a... Um, uh, quite serious effects, yeah? and we t we're talking about radiation damage. Now, itself, when the uh, when we have a single self interstitial, they tend to uh, the same way as uh, uh, interstitial carbon uh, will form specific crystalline uh, structures. Yes. So if if I if I push an iron atom into an interstitial position, yeah, as in a um, in radiation damage, you will, they will f tend to form 110 dumbbells, we know, or 111 um, uh, dumbbells, or which are also called crowdayons, hmm? because the, you know, there should only be one atom here. There are two atoms uh, in that space, so they, they crowd each other up. Hmm? Okay, and, and you can see that uh, these uh, substitutional defects, of course, um, are very high energetic uh, situ um, um, defects. Okay, so how 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 this this thing formed? So you have your high energy uh, neutrons, for instance. They dis they they create displacement cascades. Yes, on the outside of this displacement cascade, yes, I will form mainly interstitials. Yeah. Inside here, I will form clusters of vacancies, yes? And this, they, this doesn't stay uh, stable, yes? These, the, you will get uh, these uh, uh, excess vacancies, excess um, interstitials will, will form voids or will f go to grain boundaries or will be associated with dislocations. Yeah? Yeah. Right. And so, um, as I said, um, one of the ways uh, to easily get rid of uh, vacancies or interstitials is just simply by annealing the material, right? You, the, you just go to high temperature, uh, then you reestablish thermodynamic equilibrium and you cool down slowly. Of course, you cannot do this with a nuclear reactor, yes? And that is a, the, the big challenge, of course. Yeah? Uh, right, and I think we're done for this. Right. So uh, we have a few minutes, so I will 
uh, start, just introduce the um, next chapter. Where is this? Yeah, crystal plasticity, because um, some of the things uh, are a little bit related to what um, what we discussed. And because I brought pencils today to illustrate pencil glide, and I will probably forget them next week. So, uh, so we'll we'll be talking a little bit more about crystal plasticity. Now we'll we'll, we'll try to concentrate in that uh, uh, chapter on really the detail of the motion of dislocations in uh, in ferritic steels and in austenitic steels, and um, how we can model their behavior, okay? So again, uh, we have slip systems in austenite and ferrite. Hmm? We have austenite 111 planes, always 111 planes, no other one, yeah? And the Burgers factor for slip, A upon 2110, yes? And they can dissociate. In the case of BCC, we can have one, one O planes or one one two planes. Yes, you'll see in a moment why I'm only interested in one one O planes, and I pretty much forget about one one two planes as uh, uh, during the course. In a, and you'll, you'll hear, but so you have this would be these are the slip systems, yeah. and the Burgers factors are along one one one. So the Burgers factor in uh, the, in both structures, is well defined. The slip plane is a little bit less defined here because of, we get so much, so frequent cross slip, right? So the dislocations uh, will give us macroscopically the impression that the slip plane is not well defined. Let me, let me tell you what I mean. Right. Um, well, before before I, I say this, so, so let's let's just um, say something about the slip planes in alpha iron. So first of all, in pure alpha iron, so I'm not talking about steels. Okay. So don't say that. You know, I, I said something about um, steel. Yes. But in alpha iron, if you take pure single crystal of alpha iron, yes. The slip plane is actually temperature dependent. Yeah? And at low temperature, in single crystals of alpha iron, you get one 110 slip. When you increase the temperature, yes, it's 112 slip. N not 110 slip, 112 in alpha iron. However, hmm? and of course there, there is a domain where both 110 and 112 slip occurs. And, and you, so you can get frequent cross slip on all these planes. However, in uh, alloys, yes, in alloys, in ferritic steels, yeah, the low temperature slip on 110 planes is extended. So we get slip on 110 planes in steels. Yeah? Now, the fact that uh, you get so much frequent cross-slip in the case of VCC means that when you look at deformed steels, you look at the grains, you never see slip lines. You never see slip lines. And the reason is, is not because you don't have slip specific, you know, well defined slip plane, it's simply because the dislocation cross slips so often. Hmm? Yeah. So, and, and this process is described as pencil glide. And so now you know why I brought this with me. Yeah. Um, so, what, what I have here is pencils. Yeah? So now I'm going to. I'm going to glide them, yes? I'm going to glide them. 
Yeah? Right. So from your perspective, yes, all the pens have gone this way. Yeah, very, very clearly this way. And it, they didn't go a little bit up or they just went like this, all of them. Yeah? However, if I now make you look in this direction, yes, and I ask you, where was the slip plane? Well, you say, well, I, you know, it depends. You know, I would have to, you know, it, uh, this uh, here and then there. Yes, so you'd have a crooked slip plane when you would actually look at the slip plane yeah? on a macroscopic level where you're sitting. But if I now give you the pens, you will see that they're all hexagonal, yes? And that actually they, all go, they were all gliding on a similar type of 110 plane, except not a, not a single one, right? So this happens in uh, ferritic steels and uh, BCC iron, yes? In gamma iron, it doesn't happen like this. And, and the reason why it's, it can do this in BCC is because the dislocations can move up and down, so change glide planes, yes? In FCC, there is no cross-slip. And this is what happens. The dislocation stays on its slip plane. And so, at the microscopic level, so this should all be parallel, yeah? at the microscopic level, the slip plane is very visible, but even where you stand there, you can see a line, right? Which, which you didn't see just a moment ago. So you can play around with this, you know, so give it around so you get a good feeling of uh, the difference. But if you, if, you, you know, if you ever get a chance to, uh, for instance, if you, you take a, uh, uh, a hardness test, a very simple hardness test on a, um, a ferritic steel, and on an austenitic steel, uh, you, you will see exactly uh, that. It's, it's, you will be hard pressed to find straight lines in the grains um, uh, uh, next to the hardness indentation when it's a ferritic steel. However, uh, austenitic steel will be full of very sharp, very sharp and very long lines. Yes? And what basically is a, a, a very a clear uh, uh, expression of the fact that if you have a dissociated dislocations, as in most austenitic steels, you have limited cross-slip and you have planar glide rather than wavy glide, which is the case for ferrite. And, and, and most ferritic steels will give you this. Okay, and this, this is this picture. So, um, the, uh, the slip direction in BCC is very well defined. It's a 1-1-1 one, one, one direction, yes? The slip planes are also very well defined. They're 1-1-0 one, one, oh direction, 1-1-0 one, 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 oh planes. However, the dislocation can cross-slip so often that macroscopically, it, you know, the, the slip plane appears not to be uh, well defined. So, it's, okay, so let me just... Uh, with my pen, right? So it's appearance, okay? Because uh, in the past, people would all say, oh, the slip is non, not crystallographic, right? Which is, which is um, really a very unfortunate um, uh, uh, choice of words. Yeah. And, okay, so what, what we will do, uh, I'm going to stop here, but just uh, for the last minute. Um, so what we'll do uh, now, we'll try to understand, you know, how much force it takes us to, to move dislocations, yes? And then um, uh, as we go, um, we'll try, we, we'll see that um, there is uh, there are thermal effects in uh, uh, motion of dislocations yes thermal effects and that uh, in uh, ferrite and and so in ferritic steels these thermal effects are very pronounced very very pronounced consequence is that um, in uh, ferritic steels as we decrease the temperature the stress needed to make dislocations move 
increase very strongly, very strongly. Yes? And that has impact on, um, on, on many mechanical properties of steel. The interesting thing for us is that this, the start, or this initiation of the increase in the, in, the, in the stress needed to move dislocations in, in ferrite happens actually at around room temperature. Right? So there are many applications which are impacted by this uh, 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 thermal uh, dependence of the, um, the, um, the stress needed to move dislocations in uh, alpha iron and ferritic steels. Okay, well, thank you for your patience. Thank you also for uh, coming uh, Friday afternoon. And uh, so next week, I'll be out of town till uh, Wednesday, and but I will, the, court, the class will be on Thursday as usual.